As the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, it is my pleasure and privilege to announce the winners of the Abel Prize 2015. Styret i den norske videnskapsakademi har besluttet å tildele Abel-prisen for 2015 til John Forbes Nash Jr., Princeton University, USA, og Louis Nirenberg, Corant Institute, New York University, USA, for deres slående og fruktbare bidrag til teorien for ikke-lineære partielle differensialligninger og for deres anvendelser i geometrisk analyse. The Board of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has decided to award the Abel Prize for 2015 to John Forbes Nash, Jr., Princeton University, U.S., and Louis Nirenberg, Corant Institute, New York University, U.S., for striking and seminal contributions to the theory on nonlinear partial differential equations and its applications to geometric analysis. So here is the citation of the Abel Committee, which this year has consisted of Maria J. Esteban, Rahul Pandharipanda, Eva Tardos, Cedric Villani, and myself. Partial differential equations, known as PDEs among friends, are used to describe the basic laws of phenomena in physics, chemistry, biology, and other sciences. They are also useful in the analysis of geometric objects, as demonstrated by numerous successes in the past decades. John Nash and Louis Nirenberg have played leading roles in the development of this theory by the solution of fundamental problems and the introduction of deep ideas. Their breakthroughs have evolved into versatile and robust techniques which have become essential tools for the study of nonlinear partial differential equations. Their impact can be felt in all branches of the theory, from fundamental existence results to the qualitative study of solutions, both in the smooth and non-smooth settings. Their results are also of interest for the numerical analysis of partial differential equations. Isometric embedding theorems showing the possibility of realizing an intrinsic geometry as a submanifold of Euclidean space have motivated some of these developments. Nash's embedding theorems stand among the most original results in geometric analysis of the 20th century. By proving that any Riemannian geometry can be smoothly realized as a submanifold of Euclidean space, Nash's smooth or C infinity theorem establishes the equivalence of Riemann's intrinsic point of view with the older extrinsic approach. Nash's non smooth or C1 embedding theorem, improved by Kuiper, shows the possibility of realizing embeddings that at first seem to be forbidden by geometric invariance. This theorem is at the core of Gromov's theory of convex integration and has also inspired recent spectacular advances in the understanding of the regularity of incompressible fluid flow. Nirenberg, with his fundamental embedding theorems for the sphere S2 in R3, solved the classical problems of Minkowski and Weyl the latter being also treated simultaneously by Pogorelov. These solutions were important, both because the problems were representative of a developing area and because the methods created were the right ones for further applications. Nash's work on realizing manifolds as real algebraic varieties and the Newlander Nirenberg theorem on complex structures further illustrate the influence of both laureates in geometry. Regularity issues are a daily concern in the study of partial differential equations, sometimes for the sake of rigorous proofs and sometimes for the precious qualitative insights that they provide about the solutions. 
It was a breakthrough in the field when Nash proved, in parallel with the Georgie, the first Holder estimates for solutions of linear elliptic equations in general dimensions without any regularity assumption on the coefficients. Among other consequences, this provided a solution to Hilbert's 19th problem. A few years after Nash's proof, Niedenberg, together with Agmund and Douglas, established novel regularity estimates for solutions of linear elliptic equations with LP data, which extend the classical shorter theory and are extremely useful in applications where such integrability conditions on the data are available. These works founded the modern theory of regularity, which has since grown immensely with applications in analysis, geometry, and probability, even in very rough, non-smooth situations. Symmetry properties also provide essential information about solutions of nonlinear differential equations, both for their qualitative study and for the simplification of numerical computations. One of the most spectacular results in this area was achieved by Niedenberg in collaboration with Gidas and Nee. They showed that each positive solution to a large class of nonlinear elliptic equations will exhibit the same symmetries as those that are present in the equation itself. And far from being confined to the solutions of the problems for which they were devised, the results proved by Nash and Niedenberg have found tremendous applications in further contexts. Among the most popular of these tools are the interpolation inequalities due to Niedenberg, including the galliardo niedenberg inequalities and the john niedenberg inequality. The nash de georgi moser regularity theory and the Nash inequality, first proven by Stein, have become key tools in the study of probabilistic semigroups. The nash moser inverse function theorem is a powerful method for solving perturbative nonlinear partial differential equations. And finally, the cohen niedenberg theory of pseudo-differential operators must also be mentioned. Besides being towering figures as individuals in the analysis of partial differential equations, Nash and Niedenberg influenced each other through their contributions and interactions. The consequences of their fruitful dialogue, which they initiated in the 1950s at the Courant Institute, are felt more strongly today than ever before. Thus, the citation. So I now have the great pleasure of introducing Alex Bellos, author of Alex's Adventures in Numberland and Alex Through the Looking Glass. And I love the US titles. Here's looking at Euclid and the grapes of math. He writes a math weblog for The Guardian and will now give us his perspective on some of the work of this year's Abo laureates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have my slides? Yes, we do. So the Abel Prize 2015 celebrates two mathematicians and the interconnections, the interplay between their work. But it also tells the wider story of the connection between two different fields of mathematics. And we'll get to the math shortly, but first I'd just like to talk briefly about the laureates. So Nash and Nirenberg share more than just the first letter of their surnames. They're both born in the mid-1920s. They're both North Americans. But even though they're being jointly awarded, they never co-authored papers. They collaborated more informally. And in fact, in one place, the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences and we can pinpoint the date in 1956. In the 1950s, the Courant was becoming known as one of the best places, not one of the top places in the world, for applied mathematics. Nirenberg spent his entire career um, from the 50s uh, up until when he was in his 70s at Courant. In the 1950s, Nash was at MIT. In 1956, he took a sabbatical at Princeton, but he decided to spend it living in Manhattan, just around the corner from the Courant, and went there a lot, and began this dialogue um, between both men, and they both greatly influenced each other's work. Now, let's just go back and look at the Abel Prize citation. 
and try and deconstruct it a little bit. It is for striking in seminal contributions to the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations and its application to geometric analysis. And this mentions two well-known, well-defined uh, areas of mathematics, one of partial differential equations, or PDEs, as they are usually abbreviated to, and geometric analysis, essentially geometry. So I'm just going to give you a brief background of what PDEs are, what ge geometric analysis is, basically what geometry is, and let's start with geometry. So this is geometry, I suppose. It's a detail from a famous painting by Raphael, the School of Athens, and the man there teaching is thought to be Euclid. Euclid, one of the great founders of uh, Greek geometry. And geometry, what we learn at school, what we think is geometry, essentially begins with the Greeks, possibly even begins with, with Euclid, his book, Elements, um, which basically turns geometry into a rigorous discipline involving points, lines, planes, solid objects, volumes, etc. And the Greeks proved many theorems. I'm sure everyone, even the non-mathematicians among us, will remember this one, that angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. But do they? Because after um, <clears throat> hundreds of years, millennia, mathematicians started to look at triangles and surfaces in, in, in a different way, and sometimes the angles in a triangle do not add up to 180 degrees. And the key is the surface, or in fact, the curvature of the surface. So when the surface is a ball or on the Earth, the triangles, the internal angles, will add up to more than 180 degrees. And when the triangle is on a kind of saddle shape, or here like a Pringle crisp, the, triangle, the angles of the triangle would add up to less than 180 degrees. So what is right? How does it work? What was needed was someone to come up with a framework a new, a new mathematical language for understanding the curvature of surfaces. The man who did this in 1827, Carl Friedrich Gauss. But really, it was his um, doctoral student, Bernard Riemann, who 20 years later made a sort of a bigger leap, kind of really changed geometry, turned geometry into maybe we could sort of modern geometry by defining a surface, not by anything that we might understand as a surface in the real world, the real world being the Euclidean world that's been studied since the Greeks. But he just had a completely abstract definition of what a surface is and how to define curvature. And curvature at any point on a Riemannian surface is defined by how you measure distance and angles around that point. So this is something completely different. This is, by now, geometry has sort of left the real world. It's left what the Greeks were doing, and it's now in this completely abstract realm. So, with this new type of geometry, what was exciting for mathematicians and for mathematics in general is that you could now start to talk about surfaces that were completely crazy, completely weird, completely different from what's gone before. For example, this is the flat torus. Now, it looks like a square, but it's actually, talking about it in a Romanian way, it's actually a continuous surface because let's... It doesn't have any edges. It has edges when I showed you on a slide, but it doesn't have any edges because just so we have a little Pac-Man here, if we move the Pac-Man up, he then appears at the bottom. So it's a, there are no edges to this surface. You go here to the edge and he comes back there. And this is a surface which is totally fine. You know, the Greeks would have had a heart attack talking about this. They would not have let it into their system. But for Riemann and the mathematicians subsequent to them, it's absolutely fine. Now we're going to come back to this type of geometry later. But now the other type of mathematics that the laureates um, are being honoured for, partial differential equations. So partial differential equations as a field really begins with Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, Leibniz in the late 17th century when they developed a, a mathematical language, a calculus, in fact it's called calculus, to describe how, uh, how things change in relation to each other, how things vary. It's basically the mathematic of change and of rates of change. And Newton required this new language in order to develop his laws of motion and his laws of gravity and explain why the planets move as they do. Now, 
the instantaneous rate of change, or the instantaneous speed, is called differential. So equations that involve differentials are called differential equations. But often these equations, these mathematical systems, have lots of different variables, and you can only have a differential involving two of them, so each differential will be partial to the entire system, so we call these equations partial differential equations, or PDEs. And essentially this is what physics is, <laughs> for a mathematician anyway, for theoretical physics, because the um, PDEs dominate physics. Here we have some of them, pretty much all the major um, important fundamental equations in physics are PDEs. The top one is the Schrodinger equation, the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics, or quantum, quantum theory, quantum physics. Maxwell's equations, <coughs> fundamental theorems of electrodynamics, and the Navier-Stokes fluid dynamics. Okay, we've got, part of, we've got geometry, we've got partial differential equations. They're two very different types of mathematics. Geometry is often visual, big picture, a bit intuitive maybe. PDEs are very detailed. You've got to be absolutely precise. Um, you've got to be passionate for the tiniest details. Now let's go back to geometry. Um, we'd arrived at a stage with Riemann where we had surfaces that didn't really exist in the real world, that were purely abstract. The question that then emerged is the question of embeddability. In other words, is there any way of taking these abstract surfaces and mapping them so we can understand and making them concrete in the real world, the real world being the Euclidean three-dimensional world? And it was embeddability that is a subject touched on by both laureates. They both have theorems mentioned in the citation on embedding, and I'm going to just list them here. Louis Nirenberg, John F. Nash, Jr., Nirenberg says, a sphere with any Riemannian metric and positive Gauss curvature can be isometrically embedded in Euclidean three-dimensional space as a convex surface. And Nash, every Riemannian manifold can be isometrically embedded into some Euclidean space. Okay, you don't need to understand in any detail what this is saying, what these are saying, but in general, they're taking this Riemannian way of understanding geometry, just purely abstract, and they're saying we can embed it, we can understand it, in this old kind of Greek way, the Euclidean way, where tr everything's flat and triangles add up to 180 degrees. There's one extra word here that I want to point out, because these aren't just any old embedding theorems. They're all isometric. The embedding has to be done isometrically. Isometrically, it means that the distances have got to stay the same. So you can't bend or stretch, or, or you, can bend, you, you can't stretch or squash the surfaces, because that will change the distance. So what isometric means is that just say you have two points a fixed distance apart on the abstract surface. When you do the mapping, they've got to be the same distance apart on the mapping. And this is, what is what's difficult, but this is also what involves PDEs. Because in order to prove these theorems, you need to do, make an equivalence between how things move, move around points on the Riemannian surfaces, and it, that's got to be equivalent to how things move in the Euclidean world. So you're get PDEs out of that, and you need to solve them to prove if embedding is true. So let's go back to our favorite bit of new surface that you've learned today, the flat torus. And let's see, is there any way of embedding a flat torus into Euclidean space? Let's try it here. So we've got the flat torus. Remember, things can go up the top of it. If they go up the top, they come down the the bottom, and if they go to the right, if they come back through the left, we can try and turn that into something that we could understand. What we need to do is we need to like, close the ends because we can turn it into a cylinder. Because when it's a cylinder, yes, you know that when you go at the top, you will eventually come around and come up again. And then once we've got the cylinder, we can then stretch it and close it, and we get this donut or the, tor uh, the torus. Now, this is an embedding in Euclidean three-dimensional space of the flat torus thing at the top, but it is not isometric. Okay? It's not isometric because we've had to stretch it and the distances change. So if it was isometric, the colored lines, the horizontal and the vertical lines, would have to be the same length there as they are there, but they're obviously not. Maybe the vertical kind of reddish-brownish line is, but the others have been stretched. This is not isometric. However, from Nash's theorem, 
he proves, he shows that we can find an embedding in Euclidean space of the flat torus. This is his work in, in, the, in the 1950s, which was extended by Nicholas Cooper, Dutch mathematician, to realize that you could do it in three dimensions. So basically, there is something that we, could, we can make the flat torus concrete. And Nash's proof is an existence proof, so it was proved, we've known for 50 years, that you can make um, this concrete, but it was only in, in 2012, following on from work um, by Michael Gromov, etc., that a group of French mathematicians called uh, the Heavier Project managed to finally produce the three-dimensional Euclidean isometric embedding of the flat torus, and here it is. It looks like a kind of walnut whip or a, um, a Michelin tire. And to show that it is isometric, i.e. the distances say they the same, the red line, the, dis so that, the length of that red line, you see there, has got to be exactly the same as there. And it is, and the way it works is that you have these kind of ribs and wiggles that has to wiggle around, and that's how you get around this thing. So this is a really fun object that brings alive this whole idea of embedding, and it was something that really began with Nash's theorem um, from the 1950s, which is one of, um, mentioned the citation, which is one of the things that he is being uh, honoured for today. Now, just to conclude, evidently, I've only had 15 minutes, I can only give a tiny um, amount, expl explain it in a tiny way, the vast amount of um, work that both laureates have done. It would, even one would have been difficult, but there have been two of them. But what I hope to show with this is really that you see here, it's the connection between the geometry and the PDEs, how they link together. And it's this link which is being honored and which both men pioneered and has paved the way for many great mathematical discoveries of recent years. They have opened doors with their work to amazing new mathematical discoveries. Thank you very much. We are now, I hope, about to go live to uh, Professor Louis Nirenberg in Canada, I believe. L Professor Nirenberg, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear you well. Well, firstly, congratulations, I think, from everyone um, watching here for your um, prize. Oh, thank you, thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, a fantastic reaction here. I was wondering if you can tell me what it was like when you found out. How did you find out? And um, what were your first reactions? Well, I was asleep when the phone rang yesterday. <laughs> and um, I was simply astonished. I, I, uh, I was just flabbergasted. I just completely unexpected. It's a great honor. And uh, uh, I was kind of speechless. Okay. And I'm sort well, of speechless now. <laughs> well, see, another question which we want to know, have, have you thought about how you might want to celebrate, um, to, to, to go out to, for, for dinner or somewhere or do something, or um, maybe how you might want to eventually spend the prize money? Have you thought of that? Uh, I, I don't know how I'll spend the prize money. I, I, at the moment, I have no idea. I think some of it will go to help my family and my companion, but... Um, I simply have no idea. I haven't thought about it. Yeah, there's definitely time for that. Now, in the explanation that I gave, I could only choose a very tiny amount of work. And in fact, I chose to talk about embedding. And for you, embedding was your PhD thesis. So that was really where it all began. I've kind of missed out the um, 50, 60 years of serious mathematics that you did since then. So I was wondering, since PDEs and elliptical nonlinear PDEs are essentially what you are, uh, are known for, if you could maybe just talk a little bit about what attracted to you, what attracted you to that area, and what you feel your greatest successes were within that field. Well, the it was I first started with the geometric problem that you described, the embeddability, and that that involved solving nonlinear partial differential equations, 
And what I did was to really complete work of Hermann Weil, who was a great mathematician. He had worked on the problem and had, had done a lot towards solving it, but it wasn't it, it wasn't quite complete what he did. And what I was able to do was to complete what was missing in order to solve the problem. I should say that at the same time there was a Russian mathematician named Pogorelov who using different methods also solved the problem. When and you were working on the problem in the 1950s, we mentioned that you had one year where you kind of overlapped with John Nash in, uh, at the Courant. Well, he wasn't at the Courant, but you saw him and you exchanged ideas. I believe you even maybe suggested one of the problems to him. I don't know if you remember that time, and you can talk a little bit about your interaction. Uh, I do remember it. He, he, was, uh, he was on sabbatical from MIT, and living in New York, although he was supposed to be in Princeton. And so we, he came often to the Courant Institute, and uh, we sort of interacted both mathematically and socially. And uh, he often came and asked questions. He was working on, uh, well, I had, perhaps I had suggested a problem to him, which was not the embeddability problem. He had already solved that. It was a different problem involving uh, PDEs, and it's a problem I had tried to work on, and an Italian friend named Cacciopoli, sorry, not Cacciopoli, Stampacchia, had also tried to work on, and Stampacchia had suggested the problem to a young Italian mathematician named Ennio De Giorgi, and I apparently had suggested the problem at the same time to Nash, and independently, they solved the problem. And uh, Nash did it by adding one extra variable involving time and solved a kind of nonlinear heat equation, while De Georgi remained with elliptic equation. And, uh, but that, that result is definitely is, is one of the results that are mentioned. I think we're getting maybe slightly too much detail about that thinking because we don't have much time. Can I just ask you a, just a final general question about your life in mathematics? What have you found most rewarding about mathematics? Why has it been your sort of lifetime love and passion? Just to explain to people sort of a little bit about well, what it is about maths. It's, first of all, you have to be curious. And uh, problems come up in mathematics that just attract you there's also a question of taste, and uh, you get excited by some problem, and what's fascinating is that when problems are solved, they lead to new problems. So uh, mathematics is an ever-growing field, although many people don't, don't realize that, that. They think it ended with Euclid, but it, it changes all the time, and in recent decades, the, what's been striking is that different fields of mathematics which seemed very separate, they have found connections, mysterious connections, unexpected connections that no one really thought existed before, and that's in fantastically exciting. And it seems and that that... Just those to work on it is exciting. There's enormous joy in working on mathematics, even though most of the time you're stuck. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But it seems great that you're so, still so passionate about it and these connections are continuing to be made. Now, we're going to have to um, end the conversation there because we're running out of time. But thank you very much. Congratulations again. And we hope to see you in Oslo in May. Well, I look forward to it and thank you very much. Thank you. Right. I think we have just enough time to go over to Princeton, I believe. Do we have John Nash on the line? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Firstly, congratulations. Thank you. Very brief, I was wondering if you'd just tell me your reaction for when you heard the news that you'd won the Arbel Prize. Well, I was surprised because uh, I wasn't ex expecting anything at the time. I had thought about the Abel, Abel, Abel Prize before, 
and I, I noticed patterns about who was winning the, the Nobel Prize, and it was quite interesting. Well, what's interesting is also that you've done something that no one has done before. You have won a Nobel Prize and an Arbel Prize. How, how does that feel also to now be, you know, that your Nobel Prize was for work that linked to economics, really, rather than pure mathematics here, pure and applied mathematics. How does it feel now to get that recognition from the mathematical community? Well, I, I must be an honorary Scandinavian. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you are an adopted Scandinavian. And I think we're going to have to call an end to it there. I think we're running out of time. And again, we hope to see you in Oslo in May, if you can make it. So thank you very much. And once again, congratulations from everybody. Right. Thank you very much. And now to finish the ceremony, the president of the Academy again. <laughs> I would like to thank the audience for coming here today. The celebration of this year's Abel Prize laureates will continue later today in the House of Literature. From 6 p.m. this evening, the public is invited into the world of mathematics. Research journalist and host Torkil Jemteru from NRK, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, will open the doors to a mathematics special of his radio program, Abel's Torn, the Tower of Abel. And I have the pleasure to welcome you later this spring to the Abel Prize Award Ceremony in the University of La, Tuesday, May 19 at 2 p.m. The laureates will receive the Abel Prize from His Majesty King Harald V. The ceremony will be followed by a reception at the Norske Teater, where science writer and author Vivian Perry will interview this year's laureates. You are most welcome to join us celebrating the laureates of the Abel Prize 2015.